Hey, what's up, guys? You're now listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today is day 285, and we're going to cover Matthew chapters 27 and 28. Last time, we left off with the secret trials that the religious leaders and the Pharisees conducted and the three denials of Peter. And remember those three denials of Peter because Christ is going to forgive him, but there is going to be a beautiful redemption moment in the epistles that you could tell that not only did Peter repent, that he followed through on everything that Christ told him to do. So as we enter chapter 27, we start to see some more prophecy fulfilled. It starts in verse one, it says, now when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus and put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate the governor. Then when Judas who had betrayed him saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I have seen and betrayed innocent blood. But they say, what is that to us? See today yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed and went away and hanged himself. The chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, it is not lawful to put them into the temple treasury since it is the price of blood. And they conferred together with the money brought to the potter's field as a burial price for strangers. For this reason, this field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. And they took 30 pieces of silver at the price of the one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel. And they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. And, and as you can tell, when we work through Zechariah, this is a paraphrase of that statement from Zechariah chapter 11 verses 12 and 13 but if you look at the text it says the prophet jeremiah and i'm saying zechariah where here's one of those moments where we talk about harmonization the author matthew seems to paraphrase that of what jeremiah stated if you go to jeremiah 18 verses 2 through 12 and jeremiah 19 verses 1 through 13 you can see some of what matthew is alluding to but he cites the more well-known prophet jeremiah even though he's paraphrasing two prophets and i don't want that to confuse you that jeremiah is a major prophet and zechariah is a minor prophet that doesn't mean that jeremiah is better than zechariah it's just that jeremiah's content was larger and more known as you could tell, it took us almost a month to get through Jeremiah, and we got through Zechariah in two days. And so that's the reason for that here. But I wanted you to notice that quotation and who it was attributed to so nobody would trip you up there. So Judas hangs himself, and Barabbas is free, and they call for Jesus to be crucified. He goes before Pilate. The soldiers mock him, and he's crucified. And, the, and this is the charge that was put above his head. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And so they're mocking him. But that's actually an accurate title. He is truly the king of the Jews and God is turning everything on his head. Even in his death, this is another reason why we say that Jesus' main language was Aramaic because he says here, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatini. And Matthew gives us the translation for that, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's an Aramaic statement. And look at what happens at that moment. It says, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Nobody took it. He yielded up his own spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him, keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, they became frightened and said, truly this was the son of God. But remember just a day ago, Jesus was in Gethsemane speaking of the cook. And so what happened on the cross, and a lot of solid preachers have gotten this right lately, and very old preachers always got this right. But you see a movement that most people tend to focus on the physical beatings and all that Jesus had to endure leading up to the cross. But this is not why Jesus sweated blood. He sweated blood because he was about to receive the wrath of his father, something that he's never experienced before, having been treated unfavorably by his father because he was becoming a substitute for the sins of mankind. And on that cross, he bared the sins for the world all those who would believe in him. And that's what caused Jesus such agony. Even though those things hurt the cat of nine tails and the thorns on his head and being spat on and beat, all the things that are mentioned, the emphasis really needs to be laid on the cup that Christ drank on the cross, which is the wrath of God, which saves our sin. See, none of those other things atone for our sin. 
not the beatings, not his miracles, not him casting out demons, not him causing the lame to walk, the blind to see, and cleansing leopards. See, if he would have stopped short of the cross with all of those thousands of miracles, all of those great things, all of us would have still died and went to hell. It's because of what he did here on the cross that we're saved. And this is truly the suffering servant fulfilling all prophecy and dying for our sins. And what else happens when he dies for our sins and doesn't make us, listen to this, innocent, he makes us guilty people righteous by paying for our sins. And not only that, verse 51, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. So the veil of the temple was torn. Now this is the curtain. If you remember back to what we studied in Exodus and Leviticus, this is the curtain that separates the holy place from the most holy place. Remember the only person that could go in there was the high priest and he could only go in there one day out of the year, which is Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And he had bells on him so you could know that he was still alive doing that serious work that he was doing. But what's the significance of that curtain tearing? That curtain tearing signifies that Christ has now made it possible for all believers, you and me, to go directly into God's presence. We do not need the Levitical priesthood anymore, and we do not need the law to access God. We can access him directly because now we have Christ, the new high priest. And because he's our high priest, we not only can go to Christ directly, he's truly fulfilled the law, and he gives us a new law, which is not of the letter, but of the spirit because the letter cannot contain the spirit. And now we can obey God a million times better than the law could ever provide because we have his spirit inside. Now we're never to reject the law. The law, as Paul argues, is for our benefit and it's for our understanding and learning and encouragement. But Christ fulfills every jot and tittle when he dies for our sins and he's buried. And in chapter 28, the tomb is empty. After the Sabbath, on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. And this is why the church worships on Sunday. It's not because we're commanded to, it's because we're privileged to. We want to worship on the day that our Christ was risen. And so the church is the church. Whenever two or three or more gather together to meet, that consists of the church, no matter where we are. But the reason we meet on Sunday is because it is fact and it's truth right here. And it's interesting that Christ first reveals his Messiahship to a woman and Christ first appears to women, both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And this chapter ends with the Great Commission. People were still missing it. They were still missing Jesus, even though he had died and was resurrected from the dead, which is why it says in verse 16, but the 11 proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. Some were doubtful. They still cannot grasp their mind around this truth of what Christ has done and that this is truly him. But at that moment, he tells them that all authority has been given to me. And now you go for and make disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple, if you break that word down in the Greek, it's two things. It's a believer and it's a learner. If you're not doing those two things, you're not a disciple of Christ, no matter what you say. You must believe in him and you must learn from him. What's the best way to learn from him? Is taking the teachings of his first disciples, which are called his apostles, which is why we refer to this as the apostles' teaching. Take their teaching and follow it to the best of your ability with all of your heart being energized by the Spirit. That's a disciple. And he says, go. That's the first command. Go. That's an imperative. So if you're not going, if you're not doing anything, you're a nun threat in the kingdom. Now going may look different for each of our lives. That may not mean going to a different country. It may not be getting up and going somewhere outside of your home, but it may mean going to your children's bedroom and having a plan more for them than cooking them breakfast, homeschooling, or putting them on a bus to be educated. Going to make a disciple first of your children and anybody else that God would bring in your life. And if he just so happens to increase your territory, you're obedient there too. So the first trait of a disciple is he or she is available to go in whatever capacity that looks like. I don't know what your talents are, whether it's one, two, or five, but in some capacity, you need to be going, whether it's to your children or your spouse or your family or your loved ones or your peers. We all have a sphere of influence, but we have to move past that state of cowardice to reach them. So in making a disciple, you're going and you're teaching. How can you teach what you do not know? Thankfully, the Lord has gifted Bible teachers and pastors and preachers 
to help fill in the gaps and help you make up the difference wherever you fall short. So that may come from Devo with Uncle Theo, but eventually you'll need something more in depth. And hopefully you sit under a pastor who can help you with that. As you continue to go deeper and learn the scriptures, you're able to teach that to other people. And not only teach, but you're able to refute and recognize false teaching. And you're also baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's making more believers with your baptism. And you're making more learners with your teaching. And Christ promises to be with you always, even until the end of the age, if you do that. And he can promise that because he's bound the strong man. The one who was said to crush the head of the serpent in Genesis 3.15 has given him that fatal blow. And all we're waiting for now is for him to finally be thrown in a lake of fire forever and done away with forever but until then he'll make one last rise we saw that in daniel and we've seen that some in matthew and we'll see it again in thessalonians in revelation but he's defeated and jesus is king he's the true suffering servant and remember although life may get hard it may get difficult jesus wars and jesus wins and you see his victory right here Trust in Jesus. He has all the authority. Therefore, nothing by any means can harm you. This is why we can go anywhere with the gospel because no prince of Persia from Daniel or no other principalities can stop us anymore because Jesus has all of the authority. And if you walk in that authority, nothing by any means can harm you. I hope you tap into that power that is available to you and it energizes you with much boldness and confidence. And we can continue to move forward and gather, as Scripture says, all the elect, and then the end will come. Do your part, brothers and sisters. Stay faithful and stay encouraged. You guys take care and have a good day.